Welcome to The Interviewers, a podcast for experts and influencers with advice and tips for getting booked on podcasts. This show is brought to you by GuestExpertsOnAir.com. Here's your host, Joseph Schinbald. Welcome to today's episode for guest experts who want to jazz up their marketing with broadcast appearances. Our guest today is Christine Durning. Hello, Christine. Hello, Joseph, how are you? Oh, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Our pleasure to- and honor to be here. Thank you. Our topic for the show is resilience is the nucleus of all mindset traits. This will be so interesting. We have a real expert here on this. So let me introduce Kristen. Kristen Turney is the co-founder and executive consultant and coach for Mental Wellness Unleashed. She is a seasoned corporate human resources executive with 20 plus years working with large Fortune 500 companies, medium-sized and small organizations. She works with leaders, employees, and teams to develop and support an inclusive best-in-class mental health and wellness culture in the workplace. Christine designs programs in cognitive behavioral techniques that strengthen mindset, promoting confident, mindful skills for peak results and wellness. So, Christine, you are, there's one quote of you. I want to start with that quote because I found it on your website and it's, it's resonating with me a lot. You say, facing adversity with resilience and authenticity to help create solutions to transform behavior and mindset is the key to life-changing growth. And since our topic today is resilience and uh, how it is the nucleus of the mindset traits, I would like to first ask you, how would you define resilience? And then where does resilience actually fit in the overall spectrum of emotional intelligence or is it something separate? Yes, thank you so much for the introduction. I appreciate that. It's so glad to be here. So um, when we talk about resilience, and and I'll just talk talk a little bit of my personal story, so so we can kind of um, talk about lived experiences yes. and a little bit about um, you know just resilience resilience as a mindset trait, um, but being the nucleus truly of all mindset and growth traits. So um, I, I'm an HR executive by by trade in the corporate world, and so um, I was diagnosed with PTSD, clinical depression, clinical anxiety um, in my late twenties, and you know I went through years of therapy. And, um, and cognitive behavioral therapy. And throughout my, my therapy, um, I actually started to develop tools and techniques around cognitive behavioral therapy. And then I developed uh, tools and techniques afterwards. And I still do that based and grounded on cognitive behavioral therapy because our minds, our neuroplasticity, we actually can relearn and retrain our brains. So um, that's our, when we look at our, our brains and brain health, and we're actually going towards brain health and mind health. Um, and that looks at our neuroplasticity. And what that means is how do we strengthen our synaptic connections? And we have a mind and body connection. And there's something called the vagus nerve, which actually um, actually connects our mind and body. So a lot of our serotonin and our feel-good hormones are released from um, our digestive system. So um, neuroplasticity helps with that. This connections are synapses. So our brains are malleable, so we can actually um, you know, retrain our brains, right? So that occurred with me. So a proof of concept that um, that ha- that it can occur. So as I was going through therapy and developing these tools and techniques, the main principle of mindset was resilience. And when I talk about resilience, then we intertwine emotional intelligence in that. And that self-awareness, that social awareness, it's self-regulation of emotions and managing relationships. You say actually resilience is actually before Emotional intelligence is kind of a, an umbrella to emotional intelligence. That's what you said. It really is. Ju- it really is just so. I look at it as like literally a, an umbrella. So we have resilience at the top, and then underneath it, we start having different mindset traits. So when we and emotional intelligence is one of those. So we know um, emotional intelligence um, helps people not only gain self awareness, which 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 is a, around our own emotions and understanding and self reflecting on our own emotions. So we when we have self awareness, we're aware of our own emotions. We can regulate our emotions, and then we look at social awareness, which is understanding other people's emotions and 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 the ability to not only regulate our emotions 
but regulate other people's emotions. So for instance, we cannot control what happens to us, but we can control the way we react to things. So um, one of my areas is conflict resolution. So, so many times people just are, have imp impulse, like lack of, or lack of impulse control, right? And that's part of self-regular emotions. Um, we look at our prefrontal cortex. That's our concentration, our decision-making, our problem solving. We look at our amygdala and our hippocampus. That's our memories. That's the way we, we regulate our emotions. So there's a huge science behind emotional intelligence. Um, there's a woman by the name of Carol Dweck who has a book around mindset. Um, Daniel, um, Dr. Daniel Amen also has a book called Change Your Mind, Change Your Life. And it talks about the neuroplasticity and, and the fact that we, we, as a growth mindset, resilience is key. People that have a resilience mindset, they look at opportunities, um, the challenges as opportunities. They, they look at the ability to um, feedback as opportunities. They use words such as I will and I can, um, meaning I can set, do anything I set my mind to. So resilience is about not only adapting to change, but actually coming be becoming a better person for it and learning from it and becoming stronger for it. So resilience is sustainable. And some people don't realize this, but resilience is a skill that can be developed. People think often, oftentimes it's in our DNA. Although people may be more resilient than others, it's actually a skill that can be developed. And that's, that, that's where people, um, there's a myth be, be, between, between what resilience really is and the fact that we can develop it and sustain it. And that's very important for people to understand. It is a skill. And so when we look at people and we look at corporations, and we look at leadership, emotional intelligence is really important for leadership and, and, and corporations and team members and in general as individuals. And it's also infectious, right? So once we have resilience, we are able to coach others on how to be resilient as well. And I think that's really important in, in the world we're in today, right? <clears throat> so so intertwining resilience and emotional intelligence is a, is a really big factor. The fact that we can actually teach resilience and we can teach emotional intelligence. Yes, um, I know it for sure that because, you know, when I look back a year or so, I had sometimes some really bad mistakes I made. And uh, because I didn't have the right emotional resilience and emotional intelligence, I'm a very intellectual person. I could be some kind of uh, Chinana yogi, <laughs> you know, I like all intellectual stuff. But when it comes to emotional resilience, I'm learning. And I'm so happy each time when I look back and say, well, last year I made this problem, but this time I didn't. And because I did learn and I did acquire more skills in that direction. And so, yeah, it must be learnable and teachable. And um, I think it's a very, at least for in my life, a very um, important skill because, as I said, you know, you have this rationality going on. And you can be in a very aware moment and you can be ontologically speaking, you know who you are and you, you think, wow, I'm, I'm just really, you know, come what comes, I'm prepared. But then there are situations that come from the outset, maybe a person, maybe some event. It could be, a, you know, something draws you into some emotional state suddenly and then your rationality is gone, you know. And I think too, you know, there's so many different things. There's so people ask, uh, often ask, well, how, how do we how do we practice resilience? How do we practice emotional intelligence? We do it through meditation, through being mindful, living in the present, doing things where like problem solving, like we, you know, when, when things come up in our lives, if instead of reacting emotionally, we need to act more logically. And how do we problem solve the situation? Um, for instance, in Texas, you know, in my condo complex, people's ceilings are falling in on their heads, you know, with the, with the weather, we're having issues. So, you know, in, instead of saying, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, what do we do to say, what can I do to, to be mindful and present in the moment to help solve this problem? And that that really, really helps with 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 resiliency. And then we talk about, you know, I talk about resilience. There's, there's seven principles through positive psychology and it's positive self-image, positive outlook. You know, how we look at the world, how do we look at ourselves in the world, how do we look at perception of people outside of outside of ourselves, and how do we perceive that? How do we have how do we have those energy and those vibrations come in, right? Because what we give out, we we what we we out we receive back. And looking at the problem solving skills, how do we adapt? How do we can we how can we adapt more effectively and more and more quickly? And you know, what are our skills and talents that we're giving to the world that 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 can we can give out and give back? And then our faith, our understanding of our purpose. So these, these these are parts of the seven keys of resiliency when it comes to public psychology, which is really about what is not life depleting, mm -hmm. but life giving. 
So when we look at we look at the world um, with an attitude of that those types of, of 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 key principles of resilience, then we change the way we look at the world. You know, Wayne Dyer said, you know, when you start changing the way you look yes. at the world, the world changes you, right? So there's there's, a, there's all these different types of of ways to be resilient and ways to practice resiliency. Morning rituals, nightly rituals, things we can do to really get our minds in a place, and that neuroplasticity changes Joseph when we do these things, and the the, the skills that we can learn from a growth mindset um, through resiliency is what's so important. So that's when I talk about it being being the nucleus of all mindset traits is because we really have to look at it as an umbrella, and falls under that is emotional intelligence, growth mindset, all these things that we can develop within our mind, within our mindset. So um, I'm, a, I'm, big, I'm a big believer in the fact that when we talk about mindset, I like to talk about it in specifics, not in generalities, because a lot of times people say, oh, I'm a mindset coach or I, you know, we need to improve our mindset. And then but then how do we do that? Let's put specifics around that. You know, I just said earlier, we we're talking earlier, you know, 76 percent of people right now are having issues around with the pandemic, um, with mental health, mental conditions, mental situations up from 42 percent from last year. So the statistics are there. So we really need to look at the statistics and look at, you know, destigmatizing mental health in terms of what is mental health? Um, you know, people often say, oh, my gosh, I have a mental health condition. That does not mean you cannot be unbelievably successful and happy. Um, I'm proof of concept. I'm, a, I'm lived experiences that you can do these, that you can actually totally can teach yourself and others. Um, and to go a second step, using resiliency to coach, like in the workforce, for instance, we can use these types of skills to teach our teams. Um, I had very, very successful teams um, in the corporate world because using these coaching techniques with resiliency and adaptability really improves not only workplace culture, but that mental health workplace culture, meaning improving the mental health. And it's holistic, Joseph. So when we look at the mind and body connection, we, we look at that connection. A lot of people that suffer from mental health conditions have physical conditions, and they think that's just normal. Um, I did. I thought it was normal to have like chronic pain and digestive problems, and it's not. It's not normal, and so I think we need to know, we need to start to normalize dis discussions around mental health. How do we become more resilient? What can we do to improve that? What can we do to improve our growth mindset? Um, Carol Dweck, like I said earlier, mentioned her. She did 30 years of research around how do people look at their lives. Why do you, some people think people are just nor, naturally born with with certain skill sets? And so she looked at people that inherently think they're born with something versus developing skills which is a growth mindset. And she found that people with a fixed mindset are people that don't look at growth, such as feedback. How can I be more resilient? Looking at not, not, not challenges, obstacles, but opportunities. So there's so many different areas we could talk yes. about. We could talk about this all day long, um, but the science behind it is really important. Yes, I think even, you know, when you think about corporate uh, culture, I mean, we talked uh, earlier before we started actually the podcast, about the balanced scorecard and how important it is to, to look at the company, or at the corporation these days, 20 years ago already, since 20 years or longer, from the point of view of intangible capital, which is human capital, human intelligence, which is um, organizational uh, intelligence. And again, here we talk about how people work together. And uh, you know, even if you look at, uh, if you just have a, co if you just have a, a business you, you yourself run, uh, let's say you're a coach, or you know, a, a guest expert to speak on podcasts. I mean, you cannot really become successful unless you are working on your physical health, you do some sports, and your mental health. Because if you are not mentally healthy, if you don't work on this on this skills like resilience, and uh, and, and you don't understand how important the context of the situation is and your self-awareness and also that you can look ahead into the future and this is all in you and you can concentrate which is not all intellectual it's really like emotional stuff right then you have a hard time you will always um, somewhere find a barrier a wall where you will have a, a tough time and you know going on a podcast tour let's say four times a month for the whole year takes energy it takes uh, it takes that kind of commitment which people have when they uh, really work on their own personality and their own character. You know, I, I love that. And, and you know, the other thing I'll add to that is, you know, people with emotional intelligence, uh, they have, they're very motivated. So they're productive and they have drive and empathy. And, you know, one of the things with resilience is I, I really want to really emphasize is that when you have resilience, 
and you have sustainable resilience, you whatever comes your way, you can handle it. And 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 just knowing that within yourself and your self worth, knowing that I can handle anything comes my way comes from, and comes from internally. So, for instance, when when things happen, my my example with Texas and the weather, um, my condo was affected. You know, I was ready for it, right? Like I I knew whatever came my way, I could handle it. And and then that goes back to problem solving. So you know you know being logical and problem solving in the moment to say okay. I need to stop and think, what do I need to do to fix this problem? So the importance about resilience is that once you, you develop it and sustain it, then you know whatever comes your way, you can handle it. And I think that's really important because I think a lot of people who, who have not developed the resiliency and sustain it, they have emotional reactions. And when we have emotional reactions, it affects our mind and body holistically. Anxiety, stress, depression, all these things start to to to, to like basically overwhelm us, right? So when we have resiliency and sustain resiliency, which is, which is the word as a nucleus of who we are as a person, we can handle our emotions. We can handle other people's emotions. Um, yesterday, I, I had to do a, 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 a large negotiation with, with the situation that we were in. And this individual was you know, uh, difficult and this person doesn't have resiliency. However, I was able to help this person get to a point we needed to get to. So that, that's really important when it comes to, again, our lives as people, but also within corporations and, and leadership. Great leaders have very high, intel, high, high emotional intelligence. They communicate very well. They're able to take a situation and look at it, mediate it, problem solve it. Um, and people with high emotional intelligence, leaders and individuals, they develop trust quickly with people. And trust is really a big foundational part of our communication and our ability to help negotiate ourselves and others in the world. Yes, because you can trust somebody who has emotional intelligence developed, and you know it, and you see it, and you feel it from the energy that person, uh, you know, has. And uh, because that person also has clarity, uh, that person can think straight. Mm -hmm. Because you know, when you meet somebody, they don't have emotional, they don't have a hold on themselves, a grip on themselves emotionally. You can expect they can just you know uh, respond or react or whatever uh in in very irrational ways because it goes together it's a mutual arising you can have great intellect but it does go together with a great uh, mammal brain so to speak right it has it is one brain it is one person one being and it's always this how this interdependently uh mutually arises you know and penetrates each other you cannot say uh, I'm really good this way because there would be like a chain, a huge chain with many, many uh, parts in it. And if, it, if one chain is weak in that in that big chain, one part is weak, then it will break. You know, Joseph, I love something you said about what, something that really stuck with me that you just said is clarity, clarity of emotions. I love what you said. And, and let me tell you that that's really, in, that's really important to have that because we have clarity of our own emotions other people's emotions will not affect us. Meaning if there's somebody that has a, a negative impact or negative reaction to something, we're able to navigate that. So again, when we have when we have a high emotional intelligence, that self-awareness of our own emotions, then we're able to manage our own emotions. And then we can motivate, our, we motivate ourselves, we can motivate others. But when we are able to self-regulate our own emotions, that helps us regulate others' emotions. Meaning if someone's reacting negatively, and we talked about attitude earlier, when you have high emotional intelligence and resilience, your attitude, you have a really good attitude about things. Meaning you're looking at the world as, and what can I do to make this better? How can I problem solve this? What can I, I have a positive outlook on life. I'm being mindful, living in the present. When we live in the present, we can't live in the past, which can be ants, which are automatic negative thoughts or talk. That's a big thing when that, and they can become looping. And then we can't be worrying about the future when we're living in the present being mindful. So that's a, that's a big part of resiliency too. And, you know, people talk about this all the time. How do we live in the present? We, we're more mindful. We, you know, we, we're, we're more adapted to, to nature. We're looking at, you know, our morning rituals, meditation we talked about earlier. You know, our brains are 65% water. So I drink a huge thing of water in the morning. Um, you know, like you said earlier, exercising 20 minutes, even in the morning just to get our blood pumping, um, cognitive abilities, reading in the morning, getting our cognitive functions going. And then at night, doing nightly rituals, celebrating what, what are the wins for the day. Journaling is a big, huge 
Um, I have a gratitude journal and I have a journal where I write and do free thinking. So those are things where we can really look at how can we improve our emotional intelligence, how we can improve our resiliency, and what can we do for ourselves to improve other areas to be mindful. And I think that's a big, and meditation's a really big one and guided yeah. imagery. So there's a lot of things we can do yeah. when it comes to being mindful and, and being resilient and adapting to the world. Yeah, that we, we have to, uh, Christine, because when we grow up, you know, that's, that's the whole issue with traumas. Uh, when people have traumas, you know, um, when we grow up, we might be 10 years, 12 years, and we have something happen to us where we cannot see in that age. We don't have the self-awareness. We don't have the... The, the situation, um, the context of it, because we just don't know yet how these people actually operate, those who have hurt us, maybe. So then we grow up and, you know, we are going to school and we study and everybody, the whole society is about just intellectual learning, you know. It's always about intellectual learning. We don't really get much guidance in our emotional development, in our emotional intelligence, unless you know, you start reading the books about it or you listen to others who, who see the importance of it. But, you know, when you go into this whole topic about meditation, you know, or self-awareness, we also think this is something intellectual. That's why Zen Buddhism is so popular because, you know, very, a lot of intellectuals get attracted to it, but ultimately it's not intellectual because you let go of the thoughts when you do this kind of studies. You get rid of those, uh, you know, weird uh, thoughts you had before when you do the meditation and actually you become more you go get you go more into the emotional state because you become self-aware you know you have the reins again in your hand you know before the reins uh like you know this is this metaphor in, in, in hinduism you know where the, the horse is there and you sit on this chariot and you have the reins but the, the horse run wild you know but now you have the reins again in your hands because you have you become self-aware you become aware that you have a mind body and a spirit and you know you can of course intellectually separate those things but actually it's just one thing which is just an ontological self-awareness and you are somehow now uh, more prepared to meet uh, these difficult situations when you do these meditations on a regular basis. I think we really underestimate that value of uh, in our society, right? And that's also, of course, us because society inf influences from early childhood that it is so important, this kind of emotional resiliency. There should be every year in the, in the classes of children should be a class on resiliency, you know? But no, no, we have to, we have to study other things, of course, only. But this what I think, emotional intelligence, resiliency, that should be on the curriculum. You know what? I, that is so absolutely spot on, Joseph, because I was talking, we were talking about this the other day. So um, I don't, have you heard of Vision Lakiyami? No. Okay, so he so he 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 owns Mind Valley. And and one of he's he basically revolution, he's a revolutionary in terms of changing the way we look at education. So what you just mentioned about resiliency teaching resiliency and, and life traits mm -hmm. as children, we, you know, yeah, math is good and all, but we need to be che teaching life skills for children early on. We need to teach emotional intelligence. There's a great book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by Travis Bad Bradbury, where you, there's actually tests and you, you read the first 25 pages and you take a test and then you retest yourself at the end. And that talks about, again, self-awareness, social awareness, um, self-regulation of emotions and managing relationships. So spot on with that. We need to put that in our education system as, as young children. We need to be teaching our children at a young age life skills. And that and resiliency is one should be an, a class of its own. Um, so there's a lot of books out there can help with that resiliency. Um, so I like what you said about the, the teaching. And, and he's that's a European uh, culture in terms of education. And so our Western culture, culture really needs to start looking at some of the European ways of teaching. And they're teaching life skills. And that and includes emotional intelligence, resiliency. So I love what you just said. That is absolutely spot on. Um, and then we look at other areas in terms of, you know, recognizing our emotions and handling relationships. Again, it goes back to resiliency. It goes back to those growth mindsets. It goes, goes back to how do we look at ourselves, our self-worth? How do we look at others? How do we look at the world around us? And how do we perceive other people? And that's going to help us start to really change the world as we look at it, right? As we look at it as people and worldwide. 
we know we have societal issues going on right now with other things happening. So again, resiliency is the way we get through and adapt to life and sustaining it. I keep saying the word sustaining it, but so important, not just developing, but saying sustaining it. And I think that as, as we continue, I mean, I, I know that when something comes my way, I'm going to problem solve it. And even if it's a large problem, we can check it down in little, little areas on how do I solve that problem and then go back to it and solve the other part of the problem. So um, I think, you know, I've gone through a lot of lived events and difficult situations, challenges in my life. And those have actually made me stronger as a person because I looked at it from a resiliency point of view because of CBT techniques. And again, neuroplasticity. I mean, I, 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 after going through therapy and using CBT techniques and tools, it changed my life. It transformed my life. It saved my life. Yeah. It, uh, it, uh, a lot of those um, tools, actually, I have to mention it, are on your website. So I will mention this in the show notes. The website just, uh, you know, it's, it will be there. I will uh, officially uh, read it afterwards, how it's spelled. It's also your company. And uh, Mental Wellness Unleashed. And Mental Wellness <laughs> Uh, mentalwellnessunleashed.com is your website. So just to say that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we have seven principles of resilience. We talked about it. We have how to define resilience and where does resilience fit in the overall spectrum. We have that. And um, so, Christine, I had this uh, a quote I saw on your website which says, let go of who you aren't and become who you are. And, you know, this is something where I look at my life and I say, when I was very young, maybe just five years, I was asked, so what do you want to become in life? I had no idea what this question was about, but I saw a policeman next to me with a beautiful uniform and I said, I want to become that. <laughs> but I just want to say how important in our society it is to become somebody. But you know what? We are already without becoming anything. We can become our roles and we become fathers and mothers and we, you know, better sons and daughters. We have lots of roles in life. We become great uh, employee or a great entrepreneur. There's many roles in life, but these are just our roles and we can very strongly believe in them, makes us successful, fantastic, but that's not really who we are. So when we want to really become, we cannot become who we are because we are who we are, you know, ontologically speaking, but then you have to get, let go of the all, all, of, the, all of those roles. So uh, again, something emotional, because as we know, beliefs are always attached to emotions. So if you believe very strongly on our roles in life, and that happens a lot to people who get retired and so they can't they cannot become and they cannot be who they are because they have been somebody else all their life, some role. And then suddenly they're retired. What to do now? I was always working in this office. I am that person, right? So this is something I would like to talk more about it. How you see this in the light of our topic, resiliency and uh yeah, that, that would be my question, basically, how you see this. You know, I love that. Okay, I, I, you're just bringing up so many amazing things. This is flowing so well for me because there's so much of what. So so I will tell you this. A lot of people, I call it living their limitation self. When you live your limitation self, you, you're not living your authentic self. And I have I've developed a tool. It's called the 180 mind, mindset shift tool. And basically what that is, is taking self-loving beliefs or ants, you know, you know, negative talk or thoughts and doing a 180. So if you think about a lot of the, a lot of the clients I have have certain limiting beliefs. Um, that's one of the models we teach. Like how do we take you know, so much, so many of our beliefs we actually gain through our childhood, whether it's through our parents, whether it's through authority figures, co, you know, uh, friends, whatnot, um, maybe look, older coworkers, but taking these negative limiting thoughts about yourself and doing a 180 to change that, that thought. So a lot of clients I have will say, you know, I, I just can't do that. I, there's no way I can do that. And then the opposite is this, I can do anything I set my mind to. So that's living our authentic self. So, you know, for instance, in the corporate world, I had to, you know, I, people used to say, how do you know so much about mental health? And how do you know so much about this? How do you know? Because I lived it. But when I was in the corporate world, because the stigma, I couldn't come out with, with, what, with, with what was going on with me and my mental health. Well, once we're able to do that, and once we're able to be our true authentic self and, and talk about who we are as a person and talk about our successes, I mean, when we have, there's nothing more powerful than leadership standing up and talking about 
what they've been through and their lived experiences, whether it's their experiences, where it, whether it's a family experience. We did a, a, a launch with a very large uh, company where leaders got up and talked about that exact thing. What, you know, mental health conditions, their family conditions. And it was so popular that now they're launching it every year and they're doing workshops every uh, quarter, giving leaders uh, tools and techniques to use with their teams. So it's so important that we as people, leaders, um, individuals, family members, as you said earlier, mothers, fathers, whatnot, friends, that we are our true selves because not it only empowers us, but we're empowering others. So that's another big word I use is empowerment. We empower ourselves when we're able to be our true authentic self. And when we have control over our emotions and we have high emotional intelligence, we're able to control our the outcome of what we do, not what happens to us, right? But how we react to it. Nice. So important. So you just bring up a very important uh, part to the whole uh, issue of being resilient and being who we are as a, as a person. It's infectious and it builds respect and it builds trust. You can't, you can't fake it, you know. Uh, when you fake no. uh, your roles in life or whatever, when you fake it, uh, it's never satisfactory. The only thing which is really satisfactory is when you start actually uh, seeing the connections between you that that, that who you really are and your roles in life. And yes, your roles in life, they have a lot to do with beliefs, but you know, you cannot believe in yourself, in your ontological self, in who you are, like meditative speaking, because you can, you are not the belief. You are way beyond the belief. That's a, like, uh, that would be some belief in, in some parts of your brain, but you are not in there because like, you know, I, I love this, what uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, an Austrian philosopher once said, Exactly. You're not in the head or somewhere. When you look for yourself, you are the outer limits. You are the outer limits of your life, of life itself, your own outer limits, because everybody is a kind of a space-time event. So we are naturally different. We might not be so special and unique because ultimately, you know, we all come back to this very beautiful being, divine being who we are. So our roles, which we think are so special and so unique and so one of a kind, might not be in the long run that special when we come back to our home, you know, where we, who we really are. So anyway, uh, I think um, already five, 35 seconds, I think we are. It's gone so fast. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So let's, let's uh, what is one question, Christine, you would definitely want to be asked before we uh, close, uh, then with all the things I mentioned then, also in the, in the show notes, but also before we actually stop. What is the one question in this context of our title today, what I should ask you, what do you think? You know, I, I that's a great question. And I have so many different questions I would love for, for, for people to ask me. I, I, I think a lot, I think, I think the question that I would love people to ask is, how did you become resilient? What did you do to become resilient? What and how? Not only did you, how did you become resilient, but how did you sustain it? Um, how did you go through this with your mental health conditions? How do you, how do you know? I, I want people to understand that mental health conditions are not when we go through mental conditions or mental duress, we can control this. We can be happy, successful professionally and personally, no matter what we go through. If we develop this, the skill of resilience and mindset traits and growth mindset. We can do anything we want to do in life. So the question is, how can I set my mind to do what I want to do? And the, the answer is, you can do whatever you want to do. I think people in life often think they can't do certain things because, oh, I just can't do that. Or I don't have the ability. I don't have the skill set. I think I would I love the question on how do I develop resiliency and how, how do I develop that skill set and how do I sustain it? That's the question I would love for people to ask me. Because I'm proof concept that you can do that. And I'm lived experiences that I can, that you, you can do this. If I can do this, anyone can do this. It's very important that we understand that it's a skill and that growth mindset is a skill and that we can develop this. And we teach it every day with our clients and our, and our and corporations and, you know, building that mentally healthy culture. But we have to have that resiliency and those growth and sustainability. Mindsets. That's the question. And sustainability. And sustainability. And, and thank you, clarity. Sustainability is key. That's the word so sustainability. You, it's not about just developing yeah. and sustaining it. And yeah. you can't. So in your experience now, in your own experience, how do you 
How did you discover for yourself and how do you use tools which you develop so you can sustain this resiliency, which is probably also, I would say, uh, one of the main factors, if not the umbrella factor of mental health. It is the umbrella. And so I the, thank you for asking that question. So the umbrella is resilience. And underneath that umbrella, we, we talk about it. We talked about emotional intelligence. We have to be self-aware of our emotions. We have to be. In, in order for us to, to have uh, control of our own emotions, we have to have self-awareness. Then we have to have the ability to have social awareness, which is the ability to be empathetic and and help help with others and their emotions. So, for instance, I said earlier in the in the podcast, we can't control people's emotions. We can help them navigate. Right. And then empathetic thinking is one of those very important factors of social awareness. Then self regulating our emotions. Again, going back to self-awareness, we, we have to have self-awareness to be able to self-regulate our emotions. And I say this several times in, in the podcast. And I said this all the time. We cannot control what happens to us. We can control the way we react. And then that community um, of relationships with others. How do we manage our relationships? Again, under the umbrella of resilience, all those emotional intelligent factors and the fact that these are skills we can develop. And that is the key factor for people to understand. We are not inherently born with in our DNA with these skills. We can develop them. Now, some people may be more you know, uh, resilient than others, others just that way, but we can still develop it. For instance, I'm a natural athlete, but that doesn't, I, I, was, a, I was a competitive tennis player, but that doesn't mean that somebody that's not as athletic as I am can you know, beat me in matches, which would, you, would happen because they practice more than I did, right? So again, practicing emotional intelligence, practicing resiliency, practicing the skill, doing it all, doing it every day. Like we said earlier, morning rituals, nightly rituals, meditation, guided imagery, those things that we do in in, our, in private shows in public. Yes, it, it's kind of um, an enlightening process for everybody. For instance, I, I feel that, you know, when I started to realize that I can actually respond to situations, to you know, to others now, because it's always self versus others, um, in a sense, you know, it's others versus self. I mean, this is our life. We are not alone here. It's a we. But when you are realizing that I don't have to be unkind to somebody who is unkind to me because I am different. I'm a kind person. And then you have self-awareness because you say, I am, right? I'm a kind person. That is an unkind person. I don't have to be like that. But also, it, it feels like uh, then it feels like you accomplished something. You've actually, when you can do this, you feel accomplished. You feel like, yes, I am developing essential skills of my life. And uh, it's not just learning some mathematic formula, which is also essential in another area. But this is very essential when you when you can uh, develop these like skills, which are like what I just mentioned. You know. Yeah, and I, you know, Joseph, I want to I want to be on the the back end of that. that what you just said is 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 very compelling because what that de- what this does when we build resilience and mission intelligence, it affects our attitude, our positive outlook on life our self image of ourselves, people with a growth mindset. It, it doesn't matter what external factors or people say because their self-worth is coming from within. So, so much of what we do comes from within um, and looking at challenges, opportunities. Again, you know, people with a fixed mindset have a different way of viewing things. And it's that's why they call it a fixed mindset versus mm-hmm. a growth mindset. For what, So what you just said is very compelling it, because it, again, it's an umbrella. And I also sometimes call it the octopus effect. When we have resilience as a nucleus, all these wonderful things from resiliency happens. That's the seven keys that I mentioned earlier. And, you know, if anybody wants to reach out and talk, that's great. Again, you know, positive self-image, you know, positive outlook, um, purpose, faith, uh, talents and skills that we give to others that we receive back. So, again, what we give out, we receive back. And I always call it the karma yes. factor as well. So, again, you know, everything you're saying is absolutely spot on. I've said this several times that you really have an understanding of, of this, of what we're talking about today. And, and I, and I love that because, because when, when, when this podcast podcast goes out, everything we're talking about, we're both relating to, and anyone can do this, right? That's the beauty of it. You just have to have the mindset. And again, neuroplasticity, there's science mm-hmm. behind it. There's science behind mm-hmm. the brain. Yes. It's all, um, it's not fixed. It's not at all fixed. Actually, my forebrain is still growing, I think. 
for meditation. I don't know. I get a bigger brain. I said, no, it, I'm, I'm not kidding, but I, I noticed it recently. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, they do brain scans and they have like red and blue and they, when the, you know, we talk about the prefrontal cortex, which really is our concentration or problem solving. It does intensify our emotions. Our amygdala is in charge of our emotions, but the prefrontal cortex really helps to, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the um, top of the hippocampus, which is memories as well as the emotions, but the prefrontal cortex is really what is, is the part of the brain that really sort of, um, you know, really regulates everything. Right. And so when we, when we, when we, I always like to say this, and, and when you ask about another question, I love people ask me the science behind mind and brain health because there's science behind your plasticity. And that's what a lot, a lot of th- the mind and body connection too. Talk about that vagus nerve and how, you know, our, everything's connected. So I think that's the other question I'd say, ask me about neuroplasticity, ask me about the science behind brain health. And, and, and we're actually going towards brain health instead of mind health when it comes to mental health. We're talking about brain health, um, and that's really think that's really forward thinking. Because if you think about brain health, that really puts the science in perspective. Yes, and you know this uh, triune brain theory that uh, our brain consists of three or four parts, whatever very important ones from the history, from the evolution. I think we have to really, as I see, in order to be um, like in peace with yourself and and, and mindful. I think we have at least in my experience, you know, I really appreciate not just our human rational brain, but appreciate as well the mammal brain, the brain of you know, emotions. You know, just if you look at animals, you know, how, how they can be happy. They can be playful, you know, and we have that also in us. But we have this this human brain, this intellectual brain, and often it gets in our way of our happiness. And I think even the, uh, the, the crocodile brain, so to speak, you know, we should also appreciate that one because it helps us to survive, repro- uh, reproduce, you know. I mean, but we shouldn't separate those things, but we should, and this is the human person only, not the not other animals. We have to coordinate also our intellectual brain with the rest of the brain. The others don't have, the other beings don't have that so strongly like we. And we get, it, we get ourselves in our own way. We self-sabotage ourselves quite often there. Well, and you know, I, I mean, th- uh, that's absolutely correct. And one thing I will say too is the only organ, and this is our largest organ, the only organ that's that's not scanned is our brain, unless there's an issue. If you, orthopedics, you know, our heart, everything else is scanned. So one of the things I love this tagline by Dr. Daniel Almond: we need to love our brains. When we, whatever we put in our mouth, or our exercising, what we do, that's affecting our brain. Nutrition exercise, uh, sleep, sleep deprivation is one of the largest um, detriments to our brain health. So we, so we need to love our brains. And if we look at our brains more tangibly, because you can't see our brain, right? We can't see it. We can see our arms. We can see our legs. We need to love our brains because we can't see right. our brains. So when we have that attitude, that to me, that, that, that's what really helps me always remember We've got to love our brain. And so whatever we put in our bodies, whatever we do with our bodies, whatever we do with our thinking, our thoughts, the 180 shift, changing those negative self-learning beliefs, changing those from our non-reality to our reality, that's loving our brain. Right. That's a very, uh, very important notion in uh, all of the wisdom traditions of the world, particularly Hinduism, Buddhism. They always speak about the mind, that the mm-hmm. mind, heart. In other words, it's always the connection between our brain and the heart. And, you know, uh, Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe Dispenza, he speaks actually that we have several brains. I mean, all these chakras we have, uh, they're all some brains. It's a system. These are systems within a system. Even our brain, really, you know, when you look at it, it's not in there in the head. It's like it reaches out to the universe. We could even maybe imagine, you know, that we are the brain of the universe, each one of us, because where is the brain of the universe, you know? Maybe it's us, you know? And maybe it's some people out there, I don't know. But, you know, we shouldn't think that it's inside us. This all works together. And uh, really, I think I think the, the lesson from all the world traditions, the wisdom traditions is, you know, when you get that state of mind where your heart is in harmony, with your brain, then you are in harmony, then you're healthy, you know, then you're healthy and healthy means uh, happy and healthy means blissful and all this. And particularly, of course, in your, in, 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 in the corporate world, 
or in 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 the world, even when you're alone in business and you meet people and you, it, things have happened to you, of course, because somebody was really bad to you on a phone call, some customer or maybe the bank itself or whatever. But you know what? You reacted the wrong way last year. But this year, you thought about this. What did I? Why did I have to react like this? And then you grow and you do it better. And that means everybody can do it because we can. And for me, it's the most fulfilling journey in my life when I see myself that I'm going in that direction and in, in the emotional direction that I can actually have this harmony between mind and uh, brain and my 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 heart so it's the mind whatever these are just words we just use words to communicate ultimately within ourselves with you know the, the, these words are not so important it's more the experience of it you know we come to uh, the end of the podcast it was a long Beautiful conversation, the dialogue. Yeah. It's wonderful. Wow. I, I just, I, I just got to, mm-hmm. I just want to say one thing. I love how you tied in brain, heart, universe, because we, we, we have energy in within our, within our bodies and vibrations are what come out to other people and same thing, vice versa. So what you just said, connecting mind, heart, and universe. Love yes, that. I mean, it doesn't really matter if you believe in God or not. It, it never was an issue for me. Some people believe in God, some don't. I mean, I'm not an atheist, uh, but, you know, I think like this. Uh, we are all kind of, philosophically speaking, this is what I see, we are kind of a billion, a trillion ways the universe sees itself. So when we see each other, then we have unique aspects to this, you know, and it's it's a fantastic play of the whole universe to have so much variety. So that's what I like, you know. Christine, I think we should close. And I will mention one more time, very, very important because your website is very, very interesting. Mentalwellnessunleashed.com, your business, your um, business. You have all those courses on there, like Manage Your Mind series, the Tell Your Story series. These are all about mindset. These are all about four professionals who recognize the importance of mental health, not just physical health, but also mental well-being. And uh, then you do have consulting uh, products, coaching products. And you, of course, you are very much in the corporate world as well, where you help corporations um, with workshops and and, and seminars to uh, increase, basically, if you can say that, their organizational capital, you know, having people uh, work together in a a bigger harmony and in a mental health. Um, So... So we come to the end of the podcast, Christine. Thank you very much for being a guest here. Thank you so much for having me, Joseph. This has been an absolute pleasure and honor to be on, on your podcast. And thank you so much. I'm so, this has been a wonderful conversation. And I just, I love, I, I just love the harmony. I love the flow. It was wonderful. Thank you for having me. I really yeah, I think it was already a year that we planned on, on, on getting to know each other. A little bit on a podcast is really a good opportunity, isn't it? So th- thank you very much, Christine. It was a pleasure having you. And uh, thank you to all the guest experts who are listening in. The recap of the show with the bullet points, they are in the show notes as always with all the links mentioned during the interview. If you like this podcast, please subscribe to have you here again for our next episode. Thank you and goodbye until we meet again. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Interviewers brought to you by guestexpertsonair.com.